Welcome once again. Right now we're at Acts chapter 26. We're going to read the whole chapter. This is Paul before King Agrippa, and he is making his defense right now. Now, this is awesome. This is a real awesome portion of Scripture because finally Paul gets to say everything he wants to say in defense. Remember a few sessions ago, we just read about how Paul started out, you know, defending himself before in, in a different situation, and th the people just cut him off, and they wouldn't let him speak. And if you remember, if you listen to that session, you, you remember me saying what Paul would have said like what do you think he would have said if he would have been able to speak here he's able to speak and this is very exciting let's read it Agrippa said to Paul you may speak for yourself then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense I think myself happy King Agrippa that I am to make my defense before you today concerning all the things that I am accused by the Jews especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Think about this for a second. King Agrippa, an expert in the customs and the things of the Jews? I mean, Paul is saying that King Agrippa is an expert more or less in Judaism. Very interesting here. Verse 4, Indeed, all the Jews know my way of life from my youth up, which was from the beginning among my own nation and at Jerusalem, having known me from the first, if they are willing to testify, that after the strictest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. The strictest sect of of our religion okay so today we would say that is the strictest form of Judaism a Pharisee notice Paul here is bragging that he is a Pharisee how many Christians would do that today how many Christians would brag that they're Pharisees today Paul is bragging that he was not only a Jew but he was very familiar and he more or less grew up in Jerusalem so to speak and that he is a Pharisee. Don't forget that back in Acts chapter 23, verse 6, he also bragged that he was a Pharisee. And Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul said again in his writing to the Philippians that he is a Pharisee. Take note that Paul did not say that he was a Pharisee. In other words, he didn't repent of his Phariseeism. He didn't say, well, you know what? I was a Pharisee, but I've repented. Now I'm not a Pharisee. Now I'm a Christian. No, he said over and over and over again, he is a Pharisee. And I like to rub it in every once in a while to Christians who call people Pharisees. I said, don't you know that your so-called New Testament was written mostly by a Pharisee? Don't you know that the doctrine that you get, the, the so-called doctrine of salvation that you so cling to came from a Pharisee? Now I stand here to be judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers which our twelve tribes earnestly serving night and day hope to attain. Concerning this hope, I am accused by the Jews, King Agrippa. Why is it judged incredible with you if God does raise the dead? Once again, notice here that Paul did not say that he was being accused by the Jews by breaking some commandment or some, you know, remote mitzvah from the Torah. Nothing like that at all. He was not accused in any way of breaking any commandment from the Torah. You know, there was an allegation way back in Acts chapter 21 that Paul was, you know, against Torah or that he was at least teaching others against Torah. And, you know, Paul set that straight very quickly and very, very effectively. If you haven't listened to that session, I encourage you to go back and listen to it because it is very Pivotal. It is key in understanding the scriptures, especially in the New Testament. So the only charge they had against Paul, the only charge was that he believed in the resurrection of the dead. Okay. And so Paul was just saying, like, why do you seem it strange? Why do you, why can you not accept that God does raise the dead? I mean, God is God, isn't he? Verse 9, I myself most certainly thought 
that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So here he says basically, hey, you know what? I am a Pharisee, you know, and he said it over and over again. I am a Pharisee. And I thought that it was the right thing to do, to do things contrary to this Jesus, okay? And so what he's saying here basically is that first century Judaism, you know, Phariseeism, and first century Christianity are one in the same. Because he said, I thought they were different. I thought I was supposed to oppose Jesus, you know, as a follower of the God of our fathers, you know, as a Torah observer. I thought that we need to go against Jesus. But no, I was wrong. I thought so, but I was wrong. Verse 10, I also did this in Jerusalem. I both shut up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my vote against them, punishing them often in all the synagogues. I tried to make them blaspheme. Being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Whereupon, as I traveled to Damascus with the authority and commission from the chief priests, at noon, O king, I saw on the way a light from the sky, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who traveled with me. Notice here he's going into his testimony again. You know, he did that before several chapters ago, and here he is going at it again. He's telling his testimony. When we had all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language. Now, this is something that sticks out. Jesus spoke to him in the Hebrew language. Shaul, Shaul, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I mean, this here is Matthew chapter 25 coming into fruition. Remember, Jesus said, what you do to the least of these, my brothers, you do to me? Jesus takes it personally how you treat his people. Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus didn't say, why are you persecuting my followers? Why are you persecuting my disciples? Why are you persecuting my apostles? Why are you persecuting my people? He said, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. I am Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you a servant and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you. In other words, Paul didn't have all perfect knowledge right away, okay? Jesus was saying, you got some growing to do there, buddy. Delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you, to open their eyes that they may turn that they may turn, here we go, that they may turn, to do suva, as they would say in the Hebrew, to repent, okay? This is the primary purpose, okay? Not that they would hear the message of some secret formula about how you're supposed to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and some, somehow secretly now you are wearing the righteousness of Christ as a cloak, as, you know, covering up your sins. Not at all. That's not what the scripture says at all. Sorry, but that's not the case. The primary purpose is that people turn from their sin that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Notice here, Jesus made it very clear. It is by repentance. It is by turning from sin. And, of course, there's faith involved there as well. But you got those two very, very vital components. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Paul goes on, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to them of Damascus at Jerusalem and throughout all the country of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent 
and turn to God doing works worthy of repentance that they should repent and turn to God turn from their own selfish ways turn from their selfish desires and their selfishness and lust turn from their sin turn to God doing works doing works worthy of repentance this is where it's all at this is where it's all at for this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me so it wasn't because he was preaching anything new so to speak it wasn't because he was breaking Torah it wasn't because of anything like that it was because Paul was calling them to repentance exactly what Jesus did to the Pharisees he called them to repentance stop being hypocrites okay stop your hypocrisy repent Jesus said I have come to call sinners to repent I mean the Pharisees as a side note the Pharisees accused Jesus of being friends of sinners Jesus wasn't friend of sinners. Jesus was friend of the saints, the, the ex-sinners who have repented. The Pharisees were the sinners, okay? <laughs> Jesus made that very clear. It was the Pharisee and it was the sinner, okay? So was Jesus friends with the Pharisees? Having therefore obtained the help that is from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, saying nothing, here we go, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moshe said would happen. Paul made it very clear. He didn't come to preach anything new. There was no New Testament doctrine here, okay? Listen, if you haven't read my article on my blog about Old Testament versus New Testament, you need to read it. Most, by far, most Christians don't really know the difference. Paul here, okay? The same one that wrote this so-called New Testament said, I'm not bringing anything new. I am preaching the same things that the prophets and Moses preached. Can you say that, pastor? Can you say that, bishop? Can you say that, prophet? Can you say that, priest? Can you say that you're preaching nothing other than what the old prophets preached and what Moshe preached, Moses? That's what Paul said. That's what Paul said. How the Christ, how the Messiah, Mashiach, must suffer. And how, by the resurrection, he just kind of highlighted this, by the resurrection of the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to these people and to the Gentiles. As he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are crazy. Your great learning is driving you insane. But he said, I'm not crazy, most excellent Festus, but boldly declaring the words of truth and reasonableness. The words of truth and reason. That's what a lot of people miss today. There's a lot of people who are far from the truth. And, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are far from reason. For the king knows of these things to whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things is hidden from him. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, with a little persuasion, are you trying to make me a Christian? Paul said, I pray to God that whether with little or with much, not only you, but also all that hear me today might become such as I am, except for these bonds. Remember, he, Paul was standing there in chains, okay? He said, I, I want you all to become just like me, except for these, except for these chains, you know. The king rose up with the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. When they had withdrawn, they spoke to one another, saying, This man does nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. 
And that concludes this reading. As always, seek God with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. And what a glorious and very exciting thing that would be. And also call upon him. Call upon him. Pray earnestly. Remember the effectual, fervent prayer of a believer. No, no. Just someone who has said the sinner's prayer goes to church. No, no, no. Of a righteous man avails much, as James said. Call upon him, and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.